Good morning, and welcome to the March 3rd, 2022 meeting of the House Education Finance Committee. Remote, remote hearings such as this are held in accordance with House Rule 10.01. This rule has been posted online and is linked to in our public meeting notice on the House website. All remote hearings will be recorded and live streamed by House Public Information Services. Members have the contents of their packets available to them, and for the public, these same materials have been posted online. Members, if you're looking for all these materials in one place, they are attached to the calendar event you have that Ms. Burt sent for today. To get on the list to be recognized by the chair, members using the Zoom interface have the ability to raise their hand via the app. Ms. Burt will place your name on the list to be recognized. Mr. Lee, would you please call the roll? Thank, thank you, Chair Dabney. Roll call will commence now. Chair Dabney? Present. Representative Sandstead? Present. Representative Kresha? Present. Representative Bennett? Present. Representative Daniels? Present. Representative Damith? Present. Representative Dravkowski? Present. Representative Erickson? Erickson, present. Representative Feist? Present. Representative Jordan? Jordan present. Representative Marquardt. Marquardt present. Representative Mueller. Mueller present. Representative Richardson. Present. Representative Thompson. Representative Thompson. Representative Walgamot. Walgamot present. Representative Shung. Present, John Present. Representative Joaquin. Representative Joaquin. We have 15 members present at the moment and there is quorum. Thank you very much, Mr. Lee. Members, uh, for our first bill presentation, we're hearing from Representative Becker Finn about a bill that updates requirements at MDE for deaf interpreters. It's our intention to lay this bill over for further consideration and possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill by 11 a.m. I do wanna take this moment uh, to thank the interpreters who are present today for making this hearing accessible to all of us. Representative uh, Jordan, would you like to make a motion to move House File 1408 before the committee to lay it over for further consideration and possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill? So move, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Representative Becker Finn, welcome to the committee. Before you introduce your bill, I understand you have an author's amendment you'd like to offer to get the bill into the shape that you prefer. I'll, pref I'll move the A2 amendment to be before the committee to put the bill in the shape that she desires. Representative Becker Finn, to the amendment, please. Uh, it is uh, purely technical, just clarifying the intent uh, of the bill. Uh, once it was scheduled, we found out that we could make it better. So that's what it does. All right, thank you very much. Uh, any discussion to the A2 amendment? Seeing none, uh, members, this is a voice vote. If you would all please unmute. All in favor of the A2 author's amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. Uh, Representative Becker Finn, to your bill as amended. Yeah, thank you, Chair Davney, and thank you, members of the committee. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Representative Daniels for co-authoring this bill. This is not a uh, partisan bill, and I am very uh, happy to be in front of you telling you about it. Uh, this bill is one that will likely not impact a large number of people, but for those it applies to, the impact will be substantial. Members may or may not even be aware that certified deaf interpreters, commonly referred to as CDIs, even exist. Certified deaf interpreters are not the same as American Sign Language interpreters, although they both serve people from the deaf community and share many of the same skills. Uh, for some students, a certified deaf interpreter can provide complex interpretation that is simply not possible with an ASL interpreter alone. Unfortunately, our statutes do not currently recognize the existence of certified deaf interpreters when it comes to interpreters provided to students in the classroom. This means that school districts are not required to provide CDIs, even when that may be the only way for a student to equitably access their education. 
Uh, in a moment, you will hear from the Nathanson family. Uh, their son Dove has been directly impacted by lack of access to a certified deaf interpreter, severely impacting his ability to learn and succeed at school. Uh, before turning it over to my testifiers, I do want to acknowledge the tremendous level of work that has gone into this bill. It has been many, many hours and many, many years um, in the making, meeting with the Nathanson family, MDE, the school district, Pelsby, MSCOD, and many others trying to find a solution to this problem. And the reality and um, place that we find ourselves in is that this legislation is the solution to this current oversight and stat statute. And with that, I will turn it over to my testifiers. Uh, thank you, Chair Dabney. Thank you, Representative Be Becker Finn. The first uh, individual on the list uh, that I see is Gloria Nathanson. Ms. Nathanson, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, this is Gloria speaking, and I'm actually going to be deferring to Dove because he is actually the person who has been living and dealing with this experience. So please, this is my son. His name is Dove. Okay. Uh, Mr. Nathanson, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony, please. Welcome. Yes, hello. My name is Dove Nathanson. And I am a 10th grader. I'm profoundly deaf and I use American Sign Language, which is my native language. I rely on interpreters a lot. And I've gone through the past nine years of being denied equitable access to my education because school districts have said that there was no legal recognition for CDIs within the K through 12 systems and the services that they provide. CDIs are trained linguistic and cultural experts that work with deaf and hard of hearing people to ensure equitable access. access. My parents have tried to help me advocate to get them in schools for a long time, but we face the stone wall of an excuse pointing, saying that they needed to be legally recognized within the K through 12 interpreting statute in order to be made available to deaf and hard of hearing students. Being denied the support that should be provided for me caused me to unnecessarily struggle academically and contributed to delays in my educational progress. Unfortunately, another perfect example happened just yesterday. I was assigned a substitute interpreter that did not use ASL, but rather another form of sign language, and yesterday was a test review day in several of my classes. I was so frustrated that I could not get the needed information to prepare for my test. And so this puts added time and burden on me to follow up with the teachers to get the information from them using another means that I was not able to get during the class time with my peers. I've endured years of many experiences like this one and I'm tired. I only have a few years left before I graduate and it is not okay that I, and I imagine others, have to experience this unnecessary barrier. This is totally preventable and the solution to the problem seems to be simple enough. Fix the statute to give them the professional recognition that they deserve. Our family and friends have advocated for this necessary change for several years now, working with the Minnesota Department of Education and the Minnesota Commission of Deaf, Deafblind and Hard of Hearing on this. I want to say thank you to my representative, Jamie Becker Finn, for her commitment to making sure that every deaf and hard of hearing student is afforded their right to an accessible education and bringing this bill forward. I request that you pass this bill so that their excuse can no longer be used to deny access for kids like me anymore. I need full language access for my education and my future. Thank you, Dove. Uh, may I ask, I also had uh, Dove's father on the list of possible testifiers. Uh, Mr. Nathanson, do you wish to testify? And this is Gloria speaking, saying no, David will okay. not be testifying today. Thank you very much. Next on my list then is Jimmy Belden, co-owner of Keystone Interpreting Services. Mr. Belden, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony.
Good morning. My name is uh, Jimmy Belden. Uh, I've been an interpreter since 1993, a certified interpreter in 2001. Uh, I was an assistant professor at St. Catharines University and uh, in the interpreter training program. Now I'm managing the operations of an interpreter agency, Keystone Interpreting Solutions. I'm also the father of six children, five who are deaf and most of who are grown. But thank you for allowing me to testify this morning about deaf interpreters this, in, in the school districts in particular. CDI is, is not new to the field. It has a long history, even before the RID, Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf, was established and certifying hearing interpreters. So it has had a long history of that kind of service for many um, deaf for many ages, and also providing services in legal settings, medical settings, mental health, um, for job interviews, job trainings, and other environments. So the history is rich there. And now we're finding in Minnesota, we're delayed in recognizing certified deaf interpreters in the academic arena in the school districts. Many of us have seen that communication is much more effective where deaf interpreter is, in, is incorporated. In this, for interpreting in the classroom, in this it's the classroom environment in particular, there's such a different range of students in any classroom, much less their communications. Some students are very successful academically, some more slackers, but you can see from that that it's important for these students that come from families, most of them don't are linguistically uh, deprived. They don't have a lot of communication in their families and some have access to communication only through the schools. So that means that there's a variety of different students within the classroom, keeping that in mind. Some students that don't have language from their home environment come to the school looking for communication, but don't have the language yet developed. So they're still emerging in their language and they need ASL at early ages in their formative lear learning years. By having the right interpreter there can make that much more effective in learning and owning a language that they've deprived for too many years. Many who currently um, are in the classroom using regular ASL interpreters, typically ASL interpreters are learning the language as a second language. They're learning it academically and then going out and using it in the classroom, but they really don't have that uh, cultural native language experience in order to help emerging students that are still learning ASL don't get the exposure to language at home and depend on it in school. It, CDIs are the most effective for providing that kind of language facilitation. Those of you who have family, uh, those of us who have families with deaf in it, we are lifting up to have a more equitable communication like the Nathanson family where their home environment is all deaf. That's true equity. So having these classrooms, our future taxpayers are those students. And those students need the tools through the communication with the interpreters to be able to build that language, those communication skills, and be much more effective in life skills to become our future taxpayers. Also, I do want to recognize some of the schools have established a pilot program or a special permission from the district to bring in a deaf interpreter. And that has then been followed and reliably proves that the communication, the, sex, the success of the student is much greater than the struggles they experience uh, with interpreters who are still trying to pass their certification. They may get EIPA. Similarly, deaf interpreters also can help those interpreters working in the districts by mentoring them. So when you add this, 
certified deaf interpreter to give them access to the classroom, it will open up many doors and lift up the language of access for the deaf community and for deaf children all over the United States, but in particular, Minnesota. I respectfully request that you support House File 1408 in the interest of the deaf community and the variety of different learning styles they have and demands they have in the classroom. And going forward in their lives. Thank you for trying to make this a more equitable opportunity for deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing and act in an access free school. Thank you, Mr. Belton. Next on the list is Trevor Turner, Public Policy Director of Minnesota Council on Disability. Mr. Turner, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair Dabney and members of the committee. Um, my name is Trevor Turner, and I am the Public Policy Director for the Minnesota Council on Disability. Um, I'm also a deafblind Minnesotan. Uh, the Minnesota Council on Disability supports House File 1408 and urges the members of the committee to do the same. All students have a right to a world-class education in a language they understand best, and this includes American Sign Language through certified deaf interpreters. The students have a right to an education in the communities and school of their choice as guaranteed by the Supreme Court Olmstead decision. And House File 1408 removes barriers to this right and promotes inclusive education by allowing certified deaf interpreters to serve our deaf and hard of hearing students in Minnesota schools. And far too often, students with disabilities are overlooked when education policies are implemented and an unintended outcome of our educational interpreter law has denied deaf and hard of stu hearing students the right to an education through a certified deaf interpreter. Much like employees are guaranteed workplace accommodations by the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Minnesota Human Rights Act, students with disabilities are guaranteed the right to accommodations for communication access in the classroom that'll help them excel in their academic careers. These accommodations are, cru are critical to an inclusive education and help lay a foundation for lifelong success for students with disabilities. The Minnesota Council on Disability supports any effort to create a more inclusive, integrated K-12 educational experience for parents who choose to use local mainstream programs to which House File 1408 contributes. House File 1408 gives deaf and hard of hearing students an additional tool to help them stay in the classrooms of their choice through certified deaf interpreters. Certified deaf interpreters allow deaf and hard of hearing and deaf blind students to learn in the language and school setting of their choice and help them excel academically by having the student benefit from communication access and language acquisition through an interpreter whose native language is ASL. It also creates an inclusive educational space for all students by creating a bridge between deaf and non-deaf students, which benefits everyone in the classroom. Deaf and hard of hearing students provide a unique educational perspective that non-deaf students can learn a lot from themselves. Certified deaf interpreters allow deaf and hard of hearing students to share their unique perspectives with their peers and all students who are exposed to different languages and alternative methods of learning benefit not just academically, but in life experience as well. We at the Minnesota Council on Disability urge members of this committee to support House File 1408 and support our deaf and hard of hearing students. Thank you, Chair Dabney. Thank you, Mr. Turner. And last testifier on my list is Alicia Lane Outlaw, Government Relations Director of the Minnesota Commission of the Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing. Ms. Lane Outlaw, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chair Dabney and committee members. My name is Alicia Lane Outlaw, and I am testifying as the Government Relations Director for the Minnesota Commission of the Deaf, Deaf Blind, and Hard of Hearing. I'm here to express our support for House File 1408. Families of deaf and hard of hearing children can and do pop up across all communities, all cultures, all socioeconomic groups. As you can imagine, these families and children have broadly diverse needs. There's no one size that fits all. And this is why we must ensure 
that we are providing these families with placement options across a full spectrum of educational programs. This spectrum includes providing CDIs, Certified Deaf Interpreters, to enhance language acquisition and content learning for children who do not receive direct instruction in sign language. I'd like to pause for a moment to share some of my personal experience as a deaf child in a mainstream classroom. I have had no measurable hearing since becoming deaf as a toddler. My parents learned sign language and I learned along with them. This direct language access gave me a huge advantage and I quickly became a prolific reader. Most of my school career was spent as the sole deaf child among hearing classmates with hearing interpreters. My hearing interpreters did their best, but I remember viewing my experience in the classroom as largely a waste of time. I was trying to learn, trying to learn through an interpreter for hours and hours was exhausting, frustrating, and unproductive. Direct instruction was not available to me. I imagine that it might be comparable to a hearing person who has to sit in class listening to headphones all day and all they can hear is a narrator with a thick foreign accent speak in a monotone and awkward English voice. The narrator may be speaking mostly accurate English but due to not being a native speaker, the narrator would put things in maybe a strange word order or pronounce things differently. You would have to work extra hard just to figure out what they're really saying instead of being able to focus on learning the content itself. So, I, in comparison, would be sitting there just biding my time, waiting for the teacher to stop talking so that I could turn to my book where my real learning could then begin. I was fortunate that I had strong reading skills as my, my backup option for learning. And not all children have this. If CDIs had been available back then, I definitely would have benefited. I would have gotten so much more out of my education. The main goal of House File 1408 is simple. Modify existing educational interpreter statutes to be inclusive of certified deaf interpreters. The way that current statutes are written, it's impossible for a CDI to meet the requirements to work as an educational interpreter in the state of Minnesota. CDIs have knowledge and experience that are on par with their hearing counterparts. And there's, there's really no reason they shouldn't be viewed as educational interpreters by the state of Minnesota. So please support House File 1408 to be inclusive of CDIs as part of providing a true spectrum of educational placement options for the deaf and hard of hearing children of Minnesota. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Lane Outlaw. Uh, members, when this hearing was posted, the public was provided with instructions on how to sign up to testify during the public portion of this bill hearing. We received no request for public testimony.
Any questions from members? Representative Daniels, I see your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Representative becker Finn, for putting this bill forward. This will make a, a lot of difference for uh, people in the deaf community. And uh, I just say it, it, it touches me personally because my oldest son is, is uh, hard of hearing, extremely hard of hearing. And uh, we've been struggling for over three decades to get the right services for him. And uh, when we finally did, uh, I just got to re repeat the story I probably told a hundred times, but uh, with the right services, he went from a D minus student in a public school and the bench warmer on the football team. And after four years of getting the right services, he went to A minus student and voted the best defensive player in the country for football. So uh, you're just getting the right services to the, to the right places. At the, and I think this will help to make sure that the uh, deaf community gets what, what they need. I also want to say thank you to the uh, testifiers today. I thought they did a fantastic job. And uh, thank you again for bringing this bill forward. Thank you, Representative Daniels. Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and thank you to the bill author and Representative Daniels for your, for your support and uh, stories. Uh, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't support this. I think it, it's a very good bill. My question is just to make sure we don't miss any unintended consequences. Is there any uh, possibility that we're lowering standards or we're going to do something that we wish we didn't do? It, it sounds like some people are having a hard time reaching a set of standards. I just want to make sure I understand that. Or is this just purely a categorical change that we need to make in statute? Representative becker -Finn, I'm going to punt that one over to you. Yep, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we would not be lowering the standards for anybody. It, if it's decided that a CDI is the, the tool that a student needs to succeed in the classroom, this would give them the option of having a CDI. But if an ASL interpreter is what works best for a student, then they would still have that option available to them. Um, so I, I don't think we're lowering standards at all. We're just expanding the options for students and their families. Representative Krisha, follow up. Oh, thank you very much. All right. Any other questions from members? Seeing none, Representative Becker Finn, any closing statement? I just want to thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and again, uh, Representative Daniels and others who have been supportive of this bill. I thank you for seeing Dove and the deaf community today. I think it's incredibly important um, that uh, they're active members of of our communities and that we we recognize that in all of our work, including our legislative work. Um, if you feel like you've been hearing about this bill for a while and like um, Dove looks like he's growing up, it's because he is. And every year that we wait to do this is another year that Dove and students like him don't have access to what they need to thrive in the way that Representative Daniels spoke to. And so um, really hopeful that this is the year we can finally get this done for Dove and other students as has been many, many years in the making to get to this point and just really appreciate your support today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Becker Finn. And with that, Representative Jordan renews her motion to lay over House File 1408 as amended for possible inclusion or for further consideration at a later date. Thank you to the testifiers. Thank you particularly to Dove. And again, thank you to the interpreters for making this hearing accessible for all of us. Our next bill presentation will be hearing from Representative Vang about a bill that relates to program funding for an innovative student opportunity and alternative learning centers. It's our intention to lay this bill over for further consideration by 11.30 a.m. Representative Richardson, would you like to make a motion to move House File 2199 before the committee and to lay it over for further consideration and possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill? So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair Richardson. Representative Vang, welcome to the committee. Before you introduce your bill, I understand you have an author's amendment you'd like to offer to get the bill into the shape you'd prefer. Members, I will move the A2 amendment, House uh, the 2199A2 to be before the committee to put the bill in the shape that she desires. Repres Representative Vang, to the amendment, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a purely technical amendment, uh, just updating the dates as this was introduced last year. Thank you very much. 
Uh, any discussion to uh, the chair's motion on the A2 amendment members? Seeing none members, again, this is a voice vote. If you would please unmute. All those in favor of the uh, chair's motion on the A2 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The motion, uh, the amendment is is accepted, the motion prevails. Representative Vang, would you uh, to your bill as amended, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, House file 2199 would appropriate 45,000 one-time funding uh, for the Minnesota Association of Alternative Programs, also known as MAP Stars program. Uh, before, sorry, since 1993, uh, the MAP Stars program has provided students in alternative programs opportunity to develop employment, academic, and social skills. Uh, specifically, the STARS acronym stands for Success, Teamwork, Achievement, Recognition, and Self-Esteem. Alternative programs help students at risk of not graduating, students usually deficient in academic skills and behind in credits. Often, oftentimes, these students are homeless, have suffered physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, are pregnant, have been bullied, have problems with substance abuse, and sometimes uh, limited English proficiency. Uh, these factors hamper learning and MAP STARS was created to help motivate those students to overcome limitations. Uh, at this time, I would like to turn over to my testifiers, uh, the first two which are students involved with the program. Thank you, Repres Representative Vang, and thank you for bringing students. We always enjoy that. First on my list is Aiden Olson-Blake, a student at the Minnesota Valley ALC in Montevideo. Aiden, welcome to the committee. As you've seen on the previous bill, please state your name for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Hello, Chair Davney and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of House File 2199. My name is Aiden Olson Blake and I attend the Minnesota Valley Area Learning Center. I started to the Minnesota Valley Area Learning Center because I dropped out of public school due to issues caused by my anxiety. I struggled with being in public places, which made going to school and other social events with lots of people difficult. Because of this, my mother decided to have me go to the ALC to see if a different atmosphere would help make it easier for me to stay in a learning environment. And after I started coming to the ALC, I really did start to feel more comfortable when going out. I started small, but eventually I even worked up the courage to join MapStars, and now I'm here today talking to all of you. MapStars is a broad-based vocational student organization for students and other programs. STARS is an acronym standing for success, teamwork, achievement, recognition, and self-esteem. The organization helps students develop employment, academic, and social skills through individual and team activities and competitions. Through the program, there are many different events and projects for students to do on their own or with others, and they work to improve skills that will help them in the future. After joining MAPSTARS, I've been somewhat forced to come on my shell a bit, so I've learned to open up more because of that. MAPSTARS helped me with many things, such as speaking in front of larger groups of people and working together with others to get projects done and done well. I'm glad to have gained these skills because I know they're going to help me for going forward in the future. My favorite part of MAPSTARS has been working together with my classmates to complete projects such as the Community Service Project, which is a project where the students compile information about a community service project within their school or the community, and then give a presentation summarizing the project and how it uh, ended up. Most students who go into alternative education are there to catch up on credits and are just trying to graduate. So there are very few extracurricular activities for the students who want to do more than just graduate, map, uh, just graduate to do. MapStars provides those who want to go above and beyond with something they can do to show others what they're capable of by participating in the variety of events that STARS has to offer. Some plans I have for the future are to go to the University of Mor uh, Minnesota Morris, of which I'm already accepted to, and to get a bachelor's degree in computer science to get a job in the techn technological field later on. Thank you for your time, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Ol Olson Blake. Next on my list is Dominique Junior Smith, a student at White Bear Lake ALC in White Bear Lake. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hello, everyone. My name is Dominic Smith. I like to go by Junior personally, and um, I don't have like any notes or anything. I've never been a really per like prepared person. You know, I just kind of like like to go with it. You know, but um, I. 
um, I started out um, by skipping school to go hang out with friends and stuff, you know, thinking that it was cool to do that. And um, doing that, I got into like a lot of peer pressure and doing things that I regret doing. And um, I got heavy into drugs and I disappointed a lot of people in my uh, family. And um, I really wanted to turn that around because I noticed that if I kept doing this, I was not going to be able to graduate. And so um, I went and talked to some my counselors and everything, and they recommended the Insight program at AOC. And I was like, at first, I was kind of hasty about it because I didn't, you know, I just, I thought it wasn't really going to be my thing. But um, when I went and tried it out, it actually really has helped me. And um, it's thrown me on course to graduate. I went from uh, missing or needing 15 credits to graduate in the 11th grade. Starting out at the end of the 11th grade, I had to get 15 credits to graduate, and now I only need three more. And it's really helped me out because um, I've always been the type of learner that, like, has been afraid to ask questions or, um, you know, just kind of went, went on and did stuff on my own. But um, here, I really feel comfortable asking these questions, and um, I feel comfortable with all the teachers, and they really help me because some teachers, like, at pu public schools or, like, um, uh, like at the regular high school, they just kind of give you work to do. And then they have so many students in a classroom that they can't just help you out one-on-one, -on -one, or at least that's how I feel. But then when I came here, anytime I have a question for a teacher, or if I need help with anything, they can always come up to me and we can have a full on conversation. They can like help me out. And it, just, it, it really helps me out. And it makes me feel like my, um, like my learning experience matters to them. And that's what I think is special about the ALT is that the teachers can really connect with the students on another level, in my opinion, or at least that's how it's been for me. And um, that's also kind of how I learned about MapStars. I started talking to my advisor and um, I heard about MapStars through other students and everything. So I was like, okay, why don't I give this a shot? And honestly, MapStars has helped me with a lot of things like engaging like situations like or hard decisions um it's I don't I don't really know how to explain it but it's it's fun and it's helped me like it's helped me um what's the word uh be more open in communicating with other students in the AOC in general and um it's helped me with uh like just making friends or even at home situations situations at work how to approach them how what's a good way to approach them or a bad way to approach them, stuff like that. And um, it's also helped me with like my speech, like speech, um, like this kind of thing, because I've never really been good at like talking to people, you know. Um, I've been more of like an introvert, but being a map stars and being able to talk with everyone and feeling included, I feel like I've gotten better at these skills. And um, um, this opportunity to talk to you guys is actually really like, like special to me because I've never really done anything like this. And I think that it's great that I've had the opportunity to do that through MapStars. And um, I want to say thank you to everyone for hearing me. And uh, that'll be all for my um, presentation. And if you have any questions, ask away. All right, thank you, Junior, much appreciated, Mr. Smith. Last on the list is Patty Hosh, MapStars Chair. Ms. Hosh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Ms. Hosh, you're, you're Hush, muted. You're, I'm sorry. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of House File 2199. My name is Patty Hosh and I'm the MapStars Chair. I retired my principalship from Cass Lake Pena School District in 2013 and was asked at that time to be the chair of the MAPS Youth Organization. The MAPS Stars Organization began in 1993 when I was uh, serving on the MAP board. Uh, a group of primarily work experience coordinators who were very familiar with DECA thought that it would be that we should offer an opportunity to students in alternative settings as well. They modeled the STARS program after DECA, and it aligns with the world's best workforce legislation. They also realized for it to be successful, they needed to have student input along the way. So we've built our program based on students. And of course, 
as has already been said, students at risk of not completing high school enter alternative settings, usually deficient in academic skills and behind in credits for graduation. Realizing that students in alternative settings need additional support and guidance to be successful in school, MAP created STARS for the specific purpose to motivate students to overcome the limitations that they've experienced. STARS offers three statewide events throughout the school year. We begin the year with a MAP STARS Fall Leadership Conference. We ask schools to bring up to five students to dem who demonstrate leadership potential with their advisor. They participate in team building and leadership training potential, or, or leadership training sessions to help them either to begin or improve upon their own STARS chapter. Also at this conference, students elect a state officer team who will represent them throughout the school year. Our second event is the STARS Legislative Day at the State Capitol where students have a chance to see their government in action, meet with legislators, and tour the office, uh, the state office buildings. The third is our biggest event. It's the MAP STARS Spring Conference. STARS chapters from around Minnesota come together so students can demonstrate artistic, career, and life skills that they have developed. Students participate in a wide variety of competitive and demonstration events as, done as teams or individually. Examples of events that students can choose from are public speaking, career portfolios, employment interviews, management and parent decision making, community service project, life smarts. We have an art display, and we also have project and artistic demonstrations and performances. The number of STARS chapters around Minnesota varies each year. Those numbers participating have certainly been impacted by COVID. Our largest number of students attending the spring conference was in 2005, where we had 575 students with 85 advisors. The highest numbers of schools since I became the chair was in school year 1819, where we had 63 schools attend at least one of the three events that we offer. Um, just to name a few of the programs that we do have, um, there's programs in Brainerd, Fergus Falls, Detroit Lakes, St. Cloud McKinley. Um, you've had a student testify from Montevideo, Stillwater, White Bear Lake ALC, uh, Moorhead, Hinkley. The current president of MAP is uh, the director at Empower Learning Center out of Hinkley. We've got them down in Red Wing, um, Austin ALC, all over the state. Albert Lee Academic Arts in uh, West St. Paul, um, Jennings Community School. There's just a, a wide variety coming from all over the state. And we seek input from students at the spring conference. And I wanna read just a couple examples of what students have reported. One student said to me, Map Stars is about finding the star in you, picking out the pro positives that we all have and using those skills to be successful. Another student said, Map Stars is an incredible opportunity and it helped me to learn valuable lessons that I will carry with me into my adult life. And one more, through Map Stars, I've gained confidence in my ability to speak in front of a group of people. I've also learned important lessons such as how to fill out job applications, interview adequate etiquette, and problem solving skills. These along with many other lessons have given me the tools to become a successful adult. Those are all things that I think are really important. We also- Ms. Ms. Hosh, if you could come to your conclusion, please. Okay. Thank you. MAP STARS is a totally volunteer effort um, because the staff involved believe wholeheartedly in the importance of the STARS program, how and how it benefits students. They uh, were just asking for $45,000, which would be a one-time investment in our students. And we wanted to defray the costs of bringing more students to participate in MAP STARS and ultimately serve to boost graduation rates. Thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Hosh. 
Uh, members, when this hearing was posted, the public was provided with instructions on how to sign up to testify during the public portion of this bill hearing. We received no requests for public testimony. So that means questions. Members, any questions uh, for the author or any of the testifiers? Representative Joachim, I see you raised your hand. I just wanted to thank the students for coming and um, thank MapStars programming for all that they do to help our kids move forward academically and find their passions. So uh, very worthy cause, thank you. Thank you, Representative Joachim. Representative Sandstein. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I too just wanna echo those sentiments. Thank you to all of the students and for the presentations, but specifically, I just wanna say um, congratulations to Junior on the, the changes that you've made and I wanna wish him very well as he continues to move forward. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Vang, any closing remarks? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanna thank everyone the committee for uh, your support and for giving uh, this bill a hearing. This is a good bill. Uh, it will go towards supporting students like Junior and Aiden um, and many more. So thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you, Representative Vang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Olson Blake and Mr. Smith and Ms. Hosh. Uh, with that, Representative Richardson renews her motion to lay over House File 2199 as amended for possible inclusion or for further consideration at a later date. Members, our final bill hearing for today, we have House File 2674 from Representative Hansen, Hansen R. Uh, it's our intention to refer this bill to the Tax Committee by 11.55 a.m. Chair Marcourt. Would you like to make a motion to move House File 2674 before the committee and refer it to the Tax Committee? I will move House File 2674, Mr. Chair. Perfect, thank you very much. Representative Hansen, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and introduce your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is, uh, my name is Rick Hansen. I am the chair of the Environment Committee, House District 52A. Uh, and I think it's been a while since I've been in front of the Education Finance Committee, Mr. Chair, uh, if ever. Uh, but uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, members, I know that you have heard about levy equalization usually each year and every year. The city of South St. Paul is unique. Uh, our school district is special district number six, and it is one of the few, if not one of the only, um, districts where the city is coterminous. The city boundaries are coterminous with the school district boundary. South St. Paul, as you know, is an older town. We have a lower tax uh, capacity uh, and therefore we don't have the ability uh, to levy uh, as much or the levy doesn't bring as much in when we do a levy uh, referendum. I have with me today uh, uh, the superintendent of the school district, uh, Dr. David Webb, who will be retiring at the end of the year and two students. I do want to note in the bill, House File 2674, and I appreciate uh, Chair Marquardt for moving this, um, it does talk about the school district wholly uh, within the boundaries of the city uh, and the, the levy equalization dollars. So it would provide about 803,000 in the fiscal year for this. Uh, so we'd ask for your support and I have the testifiers ready. Thank you, Representative Hansen. First on my list, is Dr. David Webb, Superintendent of the South St. Paul Public Schools. Superintendent, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yeah, it's uh, Dave Webb, South St. Paul Schools Superintendent. Please proceed. Well, thank you, Chair Dabney, for having us today. Uh, and just uh, thanks to all of the members online. Thanks for Rick Hansen for getting this coordinated and. Uh, scheduled for today. I have two students with me that are both senior high school. So I first have Molly Schmidt, who's immediately to my left. And I also have Adriana Contreras and uh, another senior at the school. And just again, both outstanding students here at South St. Paul. And we're each going to share a little bit of the story. Excellent. Ms. Schmidt, welcome to the committee. As you've seen others do, Please introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. 
Hi, my name is Molly Schmidt. I'm a senior at Sussex Hall. Please proceed. Hi, um, I'm Molly Contreras. I'll be beginning with uh, the testimony today. That's all oh, right. Thank you very much. Welcome. Okay. Hi. So I just like to introduce, I think that with things like this, it's easy to get caught up in the statistics and the numbers here. And Molly and I are here to put a face to these numbers and remind you that they stand for something. These counts and statistics are made up of real students who experience real effects from the lack of funding. Our goal is to represent that this isn't just numbers and ideas, it's a force at work at South St. Paul Act giving students an observable disadvantage. So to begin, um, Molly and I are both part of the IB diploma program. And I really see impact here. I'm seeing less IB teachers. I'm seeing IB teachers with less training. And I'm seeing with the and the experience having to extend themselves. One of our IB teachers right now has taken in another IB class because the person who runs that class just doesn't have the training or the skills to be able to do that. And that's directly from our lack of funding. We've got, I see less opportunities. I see less opportunities for courses. Um, students this try and throughout the year who wanted to um, take photography were put into a drawing class because of lack of resources. And a couple of years ago, Molly and I both signed up for a PLTW course that we couldn't take because we couldn't pay for the CAD design or the CAD program. And we were put into a course where the teacher had never teach the course or, or taught the course or used that programming. And just generally, IB is very diverse and we're just forced into a box because of our lack of funding here. And moving on to like observably what we can see, we're seeing larger class size, less staff and a large amount of teacher turnover, which I think Molly has a lot to say about. And just before Molly goes, let's just tell you a little bit about the why. Why are we seeing fewer electives? Why are we seeing fewer teachers here in South St. Paul? So the, the state of Minnesota and really set up by the legislature allocates about $6,000 per student for every student in state funding. That is equal across the state of Minnesota. What's not equal is what's called the local levy. And typically school districts can levy up to $2,000. The reason that uh, there's a problem is that about a third of the students in the state live in areas of the state, and it's not a Democratic issue, it's not a Republican issue, it's uh, really a poverty issue oftentimes, and uh, if you happen to be fortunate enough to live in a community with a large corporation, paying school taxes for parents is not much of an issue. So. Why is that? So think of one big bucket and in every community, all the taxes by community members and the businesses in the community go into one bucket to pay the school tax rates. When uh, some of our largest corporations put into that bucket, families in those communities can pay a much lower rate of tax. So on the handout that I have for you that has this pizza example, and hopefully you receive that handout today. What happens when the $2,000 uh, doesn't have equity, isn't equalized, isn't fair for our community? And like I said, about 30% of the communities around the state have this unfair tax rate. When um, in this West St. Paul, South St. Paul example, when West St. Paul and South St. Paul pay the same uh, rate of tax of what the amount of tax $238. You'll see that West St. Paul schools generate twice as much for their kids, for their teachers, for their staff, for their programs than they do in South St. Paul. On this handout, when we both pay $238, and that's the actual amount that both of our communities are paying right now, same amount. West St. Paul generates double. And you can see that pattern all over the metro. Moundsview pays half to get the same amount that Centennial would raise. So uh, Roger Chamberlain's district, for example, uh, when they wanna pay the same amount in both communities, Moundsview will get double what Centennial will get. When we pay the same amount, West St. Paul gets double what South St. Paul gets in that other 25% that's not fully funded by the state called the local levy. 
So Molly's going to share a couple more examples of how it's harming kids in South St. Paul and our opportunities. Thank you, Dr. Webb. Um, Dr. Like, Red, welcome. Oh, yeah. Like Ariana was saying, we just want to emphasize that this is not just data, but real experiences that we are confronted with every day. Um, so like Ariana was talking about teacher turnover, like more than ever, we're seeing such a divide with teachers that have been here for like 10, 15 years versus teachers that are here in their first or second year. And that inexperience is so unfair to us as students. Um, like, for example, we have our Ivy Music program that was completely debilitated several years back when our last Ivy Music teacher left. We've been um, getting in a new teacher, but that we are unable to send them to IB training. So they're unable, unable to provide the course for us. So we only have um, IB art and then like IB business, IB psychology. We're not offering enough electives, enough electives, especially that IB students can fit into their days. Along with that, um, we don't have the time or resources for a seven period day, like all of the communities around us are doing at their schools. Um, which is completely unfair, especially like we were talking about with like the IB diploma, which we are both candidates for. It's so like Adiana described, it's such like a box. Like you have to have a very specific um, schedule. schedule in order to do that. And without the seven period day, we're unable to take courses that we want to take. And then lastly, um, my dad, who is the director of learning for the South St. Paul School District, is has been continuously gaining more duties and more responsibilities throughout the last year but he retains the same title, he makes the same money, and he has no extra help. Like along with that, there's less staff, not only for him, but for our school, our students, and our community as a whole. So when we try to keep class size low, and Superintendent. from the class size, the district office picks up more, and Molly's dad's a pretty good example of that. So uh, we have just a couple of questions that uh, Molly will close with and uh, the students will close with. To really get to the heart of what do you want for all students in Minnesota and what do you want for your own kids? I'll let them take it away. Why should Molly. our parents pay Molly. double the taxes to Let's raise? Start again. Okay. Why should our parents pay double the taxes to raise the same amount of money for our schools? Why should our school have fewer teachers, paras, and staff for our students? And do you want the students in your own school districts to get 100% of school funding or 50%? Nadia? Ms. Contreras? Yes. Shouldn't the answer to the question, where is the best place to get school support for Minnesota, school, for Minnesota kids, be every Minnesota school? Why do some of the highest poverty communities pay the highest tax rates? And then finally, can you give our students hope and fix the broken tax law with a $9 billion surplus? Thank you. Thank you. So that's our hope for today. Um, we really appreciate the invitation to be here today. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Senator Hansen, Rep Senator Representative Hansen, for sponsoring our legislation today. We know there's other uh, equalization legislation uh, being produced as well, but we uh, we need help. And uh, this is my last year as superintendent in South St. Paul. It's been 12 years. Uh, we're 10 of 12 have been on budget cutting years. One year we didn't have to cut. We already had all day kindergarten and all day kindergarten was fully funded by the legislature. And one year we passed the levy and we didn't reduce that year. But 10 of my 12 years have been in reductions because we're not keeping pace with inflation and we face inequitable tax rates. So uh, we need your help. Uh, the next South St. Paul superintendent needs your help too. And for all of our kids here in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Webb. Uh, members, when this hearing was posted, the public was provided with instructions on how to sign up to testify during the public portion of this bill hearing. We received no requests for public testimony. Representative Hans, or excuse me, members, any uh, questions? Representative uh, Joachim, can you speak, or, or Chair Marcourt, uh, Chair Joachim or Chair Marcourt, can you speak to the issues around equalization and uh, the, the challenges that different communities face and different school districts face? So, well, Chair Marcourt. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, so one of the big problems with uh, equalization just around the state and almost all the programs is that 
only a few of them have like a, an inflator. So uh, a lot of times that number equalization factor, which your property tax base per student is compared to, is frozen. So as values go up, you end up paying more levy and getting less state aid. And, and then just generally, uh, the amount of money going in there doesn't expand. So it does force uh, more uh, property taxes uh, increasingly on school districts, uh, which increases the levy and makes it more difficult. So uh, it is something in uh, the tax committee and Chair Joachim can talk more to this. Uh, we will be looking at uh, some equalization options. And I will also say to you, Mr. Chair, that if we do equalization, uh, I'm willing to uh, have that target in the tax bill rather than K through 12 education. And I, as a former education chair, I always remember it was nice if the tax uh, committee could take that. So that's what we're looking at. But I think Chair Joaquin may want it because she will be hearing uh, these equalization bills as they come forward. So I would yield to Chair Joaquin, Chair Dabb. Thank you, Chair Marquardt. Chair Joaquin, can you help us out further? <laughs> thank you, it's Mr. A Chair. Area. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think what this bill highlights is something all of our schools are struggling with. As we talked about yesterday, um, you know, base funding is kind of like the cake in education. It's what all school districts need to help their children and students, scholars succeed. And levies have always been, especially local uh, um, excess operating levies, have always been that icing on the cake that um, helps districts do a little bit more if their taxpayers are willing to vote for those levies. Unfortunately, because of our lack of funding and our lack of putting batter into that cake to make it big enough, um, these excess levies are um, becoming part of that batter. Now, this uh, that we're looking at here is like the local optional, optional um, levy. It's not the excess levy, but that just shows you how much these levies are important. We've changed the structure over the years on this levy and put more money into equalization and the superintendent kind of explained it well. Some schools to get that $1 only have to charge their taxpayers 50 cents. Other schools to get that dollar have to charge their taxpayers $1.50. So equalization helps us bring us all closer to that dollar. Um, the bills that we're looking at um, in property tax division and in full taxes um, would help districts across the state um, even out that equalization as well. So um, hopefully we'll be able to be spending money so that we won't just you know, be helping one district but helping um, many across the state. So that's kind of the lay of the land there. Thank you, Chair Ewakim. Representative Krisha, I see you have your hand up. I do, uh, and, and thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you to the bill author. Uh, and Representative Marcourt, uh, you have a firm grasp of this as the tax committee chair now, as well as uh, a past Education finance chair and, and the points I just want to raise up no real question, but I I know there's going to be a lot involved if you look at the equalization and just some other points that we should raise. Uh, first of all, I, I think it's an odd way to approach this uh, coming in with just one specific incident one school district Well, I understand there's conversations around that. Um, there are many all the school districts would love to have that opportunity to carve it out for just them. Um, and I think the other things that we have to talk about that were not brought up today is uh, how we would look at all the different revenue streams, whether it's compensatory and so forth. Are we willing to redo those streams across the board? Because our makeups and the disparities of these situations aren't just because there's unequal revenue around the state. It's because we have different levels of businesses. We have different levels of tax bases, whether it's agriculture, and so forth. We have different levels of income. And all of these things weigh into this, which create these disparities. And while on one hand, we're in the Education Finance Committee, we have to look at that from a finance perspective. What we also have to consider is the taxpayer side. And these people choose to live where they live. They understand their property values. They understand their, their makeups and how the taxes roll out for them. And so that consideration, I just think, needs to be brought up in light of this conversation. I appreciate the superintendent for bringing this forward. I um, appreciate your service, and I, I hope retirement is a happy one. Um, but we also have to be cognizant of 
every one of us would love to have our schools here carving this formula out for themselves. Thank you, Representative Krisha. With that, uh, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And the reason uh, we have this bill for South St. Paul is because I think it does provide a unique case. Uh, I have only up to pre-COVID numbers, but the city of South St. Paul was the one community in Dakota County where property values actually decreased. Not all the suburbs are wealthy. The high school where the students and Dr. Webb, where Dr. Webb works and the students go is, I believe, built in 1907. Is that correct, uh, Dr. Webb? Dr. Webb. We are actually uh, celebrating the 100 year anniversary of our building here. It's 1922 officially. So thank you. I think they might have broke ground in 1907 and didn't get built <laughs> that, until 1922. But that could be. Uh, I stand corrected. Uh, but I, I want to give that as an example of uh, we have a property poor district. There are census tracts in the district that are recognized as environmental justice areas because of the poverty rate and the impacts. And so that's why we're here individually. I am fully aware that there will be a comprehensive effort for level equalization. And I know that there are a number of people working on that. I'm just asking that you don't forget South St. Paul and communities like that as you try to fix the big problem. And often when we get to the end, uh, we put money into the formula and putting money into the formula will not fix the equalization problem for communities, whether they are rural, suburban, or urban. We're asking for your help, um, please, if you could provide some assistance through equalization. Uh, and I know this committee and Chair Mark Ward and Chair Joaquim will be working diligently. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Hansen. Did we lose our chair? Let me just track him down. Perhaps he's on his way to visit South St. Paul. We made such a good case. This is the second time this has happened in a committee today for me that we lost our chair in the middle of things. It actually happened in Representative Hansen's committee earlier this week. I think when you were presenting a bill, Chair. Here he comes. Uh, members, I, that was particularly poor timing for my uh, <laughs> to drop out. I'm sorry, I had to run to the basement to uh, reboot the, 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 the thing, thingamajig. You know what I'm talking about. Um, so that was, so I apologize for that. Uh, so members, uh, at this point, uh, we will be, we are approaching a vote. Uh, so I would ask uh, this will be a, a voice vote and it will be a roll call. So I would ask for uh, members to unmute as uh, Mr. Lee calls the vote after I say, let's see, Representative Marcourt renews his motion to move uh, to refer House File 2674 and refer it to the tax committee. With that, Mr. Wilson, please take the roll. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will now commence roll call voting on HF 2674. Chair Davney? Aye. Chair Lee? Aye. Chair Davney? Davney votes aye. Chair Davney, aye. Davney, aye. Representative Sandstead? Aye. Representative Sandstead, aye. Representative Kresha? 
Krisha, aye. Representative Krisha, aye. Representative Bennett? Aye. Representative Bennett, aye. Representative Daniels? Daniels votes aye. Representative Daniels, nay. Representative Damoth? Not nay, yay. Oh, yay, okay. Representative Daniels, a. Uh, Representative Damoth? Aye. Representative Damoth, aye. Representative Drafkowski? No. Representative Drafkowski, nay. Representative Erickson? Erickson votes aye. Representative Erickson, aye. Representative Feist? Aye. Representative Feist, aye. Representative Jordan? Jordan, aye. Representative Jordan, aye. Representative Marcourt? Marcourt, aye. Representative Marcourt, aye. Representative Mueller? Mueller votes yes. M Representative Mueller, aye. Representative Richardson? Richardson, aye. Re Representative Richardson, aye. Representative Thompson? Representative Thompson? Representative Walgamot? Aye. Representative Walgamot, aye. Representative Shong? Aye. Representative Shong, aye. Representative Joaquim? Aye. Representative Joaquim, aye. Uh, Representative Thompson? Representative Thompson? Mr. Chair, I report we have 15 ayes, one nay, and one abstain. Um, with that, members, uh, House File 2674, the motion uh, prevails and is on to the tax committee. Thank you, uh, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Dr. Webb. Uh, thank you, Ms. Schmidt and Ms. Contreras. Uh, congratulations on your imminent graduation as seniors. Best of luck to whatever comes next. Members, with that, uh, our work for today and the week is almost completed. Representative Sandsteep, you were quick to point out that I jumped over the minutes uh, earlier in the hearing. Would you please move the minutes if you've reviewed them from our Wednesday, March 2nd, 2022 hearing? I will, Mr. Chair. I move the minutes of March 2nd, uh, 2022. All right, thank you very much. Any discussion to the Sandsteep motion? Hearing none, uh, members of voice vote, please unmute. All those in favor of the Sandsteed motion approving the minutes from Wednesday, March 2nd, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. Members, with that, our work for today and the week is done. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you very much. We are adjourned. Mm -hmm.